Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 295 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, January 15th, 2024, and it is definitely winter here at the Beaver Lodge. Most definitely. I am your host, the eager beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, in a polo that I really, really like on him. Boy, thank you, sir. You are looking good. I like the combination of that orange and that blue. Is that my computer or yours? <laughs> yeah, Hearing noises. <laughs> um, a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Normally, we have a longer show for you on Monday, but it's uh, every third Monday. I got to be at the curling arena at 9 a.m. to curl with the old guys because uh-huh. I'm an old guy now. Uh-huh. So, um, yep, it's going to be a short show. Ah, and we have Kit uh, James with us saying thanks again for coming on Casual Friday. Yeah, it was great. I always love it very much. Hello to all the Kits watching us Kit Saucy, Kit Elaine, Kit My Dogs Are Goth, Kit Sean, Kit Elaine, Kit Tabby G. Who else do we have with us? Kit Vim. Hello, lovely Kit Cassie. Hello, my dear. Kit Hugh. Hello, my good friend. And let's see. And if I've missed you, Kit Linda M., of course. And I think I have everyone. But before we do anything else, let's say good morning to you, Mr. Grizzly. Oh, Miss Sedeka. Hello to you and family. And ask, how are you doing today? How's your mental health today, sir? While I munch on some of my honey nut cherry Mateos. <laughs> Um, good morning, Mr. Beaver. I am uh, a little groggy. Uh, I did I did wake up at 5 and then again at 6 and then I hit the alarm snooze for till 6.30 till I crawled out of bed. Uh, my beloved uh, was singing in her sleep last night. <laughs> She's going to kill me for telling, <laughs> telling tales out of, out of school, but it woke me up at about 1.30 and then I couldn't get back to sleep for a while. And uh, she started to sing, woke me up, and I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. realized what, where I was and what was happening. And I thought, I should, I should record this because, you know, it'd be funny. And then uh, I, I got grabbed my phone, hit the ready to record. No, went right back to sleep. Oh, oh mm. damn it. Well, went back to sleep, just stopped singing, stopped talking. And yeah, it was funny. Was she singing peanut butter jelly time? No, no. <laughs> me. Like they weren't words. It was just like uh, humming a tune of some type. It was, uh, yeah, it was funny. It was very funny. All right. Uh, kids, we have, ha, I like that kid. Everybody thinks that I'm looking fashionable. I, I felt like dressing up today. And kid James goes, if you made a shirt out of Douglas's cereal bowl, it would be my most fashionable shirt. <laughs> well, what, what, um, it's pretty bowl. If we if we go by the British uh, ism, if you will, that would be called a waistcoat that you're wearing, and not a yes. vest. Yes, yes, 
And I only learned that a couple of years ago. My buddy yes. was like, Ooh, I like the waistcoat he's wearing. I'm like, what? The waistcoat. What are you talking about? The waistcoat. His vest. Why didn't you just say his vest and then tell me it's also called a waistcoat? Do you think I'm supposed to know that right away? Don't bury the lead. <sighs> <laughs> all right, kids and cubs. Uh, a lot's going on. Uh, first of all, um, we have to uh, give our condolences to the Broadbent family. Yes, we, we, we neglected uh, to do that last week. We were kind yes. of tied up. And, yeah, he lived in uh, he lives in my neighborhood. Until, I went well, lived in my neighborhood until just recently. Yeah, just not far from here, just a couple of blocks away, down the street from my buddy. Actually, mm -hmm. we used to see him just out walking around, and he hey. Yeah, just a regular guy, no security detail, no nothing, just a regular guy. You know what, though, the thing is, I don't think Ed Broadbent really had any enemies in this world. I, I mean that sincerely. It, ah. His political opponents loved and respected the man, right? Yep. Sorry, I got a little, little funky stuff going on with my lighting here for some reason. I see that. Yeah, it's gone good. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's uh, absolutely absolute truth. I went to a school for one year, I think, in high school with his daughter. Oh yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, the, the lights are just not working today. Oh. Um, so yes, Mr. Broadbent was first elected to the House of Commons in 1968, and he led the NDP through four elections over 14 years. In 1988, which was known as the Free Trade Election, mm -hmm. he netted the greatest number of seats for his party, 43, which remained the high until Jack Layden uh, scored his uh, big win. That led him to be leader of the opposition, which unfortunately he did not get to sit for long as the leader of the opposition because he had passed away. Um, he uh, came back to politics in 2004 under Jack Layton and mm -hmm. seat, uh, but quit one year later because his wife Lucille had breast cancer from which she passed away in 2006. Prime Minister Mulroney said of him, he'd have been Prime Minister had he been leading any other party, but he chose to lead his party to great degrees of success. And so I viewed him as a great contributor to Canadian unity, to Canadian public policy, and he was an extremely pleasant, delightful guy to know, a giant of politics. Um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau described him as an advocate for equality and a champion for justice, a man whose commitment to helping others never wavered. And Jagmeet Singh, the current leader of the NDP, described him as a titan of social democracy, a friend, a mentor. And quote, I was really amazed and inspired by someone who constantly wants to find a way to make life for people, better for people, and he never stopped. Um, there were some statements also from Pierre Polièvre uh, on his uh, Twitter feed. In fact, on that day, he had Twitter's uh, uh, statements uh, recognizing the birthday of John, Sir John A. Macdonald and the birthday of uh, Jacques Chrétien, who celebrated his 90th. That's right. And, and also uh, words for Ed Broadbent, which I cannot bring myself to believe that he would ever mean or that he ever wrote. I'm sure it's one of his staff members because we know very well that if Ed Broadbent were in Parliament today, he would be crucifying Ed on the daily. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And saying the worst shit about him. So, um, you know, I think it was George Burns that says if you can uh, fake sincerity, like you kind of got it made. And, uh, well, he attempted sincerity through his Twitter feed. I don't, I don't know if he bought, I believed it or if I bought it. So let's just put it that. But maybe that's just my personal bias. Well, is... I do believe he is the most inauthentic man in Canada at the moment. So, and there's nothing authentic about him. No. So maybe it's just me. Could be. Could be. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of in that same boat with you, though. So you know, there, we, there it is. Right. I feel the same way too. Ah, uh, there we go. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Ah, uh, there we go. There's, the, there's, the, there's the light. All right. In other news, I, I don't think you could have avoided it. Uh, over the course of the weekend, but uh, there's been a cold snap out west. Uh, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and particularly Alberta have been affected. Uh, as we mentioned, I think, on a, another show, uh, one day, I believe, the high in Calgary was scheduled to be minus 32. 
Yeah. And in Edmonton, they were predicting an actual minus 40. Well, they got worse than that. Yes, they did. And I think with windchill, it got down to minus 51, uh, which is a number I can't wrap my head around. Oh, I can. I've worked outside in it. It's, um, it's mind-numbingly cold. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that in Edmonton, there was a choice to um, break up homeless encampments during the period. Yes which was seemed to be really cruel on the basis that there was enough room in the shelters so there they should wasn't. go there. Um, whether there was or there wasn't, we all know that there are certain people who will not go to shelters. Period. Period. So um, particularly bad time to be taken away their encampments. And all that money, an operation, a police operation to break up an encampment costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That money could have been used to house people. Or to set up a space in the city where there can be an encampment and then use the police there to actually protect the people in the encampment. Maybe. If we treated people like people. Rather than that's, taking away their homes. That's uh, asking a, a lot for a lot of politicians, though, today. The, uh, you know. Yeah, but these are choices. Homelessness is a policy choice. Breaking yeah, up encampments yeah. when you could be setting up a space for those who you know will not go to shelters, is a choice. Not having a housing first policy is a choice. Not Did having you? some shelters that don't have certain rules that the people who won't go to shelters, having a variety of them. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. Maybe mixing a safe consumption site with some shelter ability. Well, we're, we're, we're actively choosing to do this now. Not you, not I. No, no. None of the none of the damn fam. And most of Canadians don't want this either. I'd say the vast majority of the population don't want this. And I know this because I've heard and I'm not joking when I say this, old stock Canadians, old stock conservative Canadians say to me, This is wrong. This is cruel. We need to do something to get people into houses. We could build barracks. We've done this before. We can do it again. The government is choosing not to, and it's costing us more money. And again, actual conservatives will look at it and go, by not helping people, it's costing us money. It's costing us more money to keep, keep people in poverty. It's costing us more money to do this. We could save money and lives and give people decency by putting them into housing. Mm -hmm. But we choose not to do this. Yeah, it's it. You know, when when conservatives, the classic, well, not the today's conservatives, complain about not wanting to do stuff, it's it's almost like there's no amount of money they are willing to spend to make sure that they keep the poor and the homeless down. But when it comes to giving them a hand up, however, oh, whoa, 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 settle. Down. We can't do that. Yeah, settle down. Yeah, Kit Tabby G. Brandy Moran has excellent coverage of this if you're following her Twitter feed. Thank goodness for the Bear Claw Patrol. Mm -hmm. um, if you see people homeless on the street who are lying on the pavement, please, please, please do check on them because uh, skin can freeze in two to five minutes, particularly against concrete. Mm -hmm. Especially on these extremely cold days. Yes, well, this, this and uh, people who are doing exactly. Voting conservative. On the left, we have a portly gentleman with suspenders and a white t-shirt and a ball cap that says, I vote conservative to keep foreigners, minorities, women, socialists, gays, and liberals from ruining my life. On the right, or maybe you're right, I don't know. But on the other side, you've got a wealthy old man in a shirt and tie with a bag of money says, I vote conservative to keep this moron from realizing I'm the only one ruining his life. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for people who are on the street uh, worried about people with addictions, uh, this type of weather is particularly dangerous because naloxone can freeze. Yes. And the last thing you want to do is administer some frozen naloxone. That doesn't end up well for anyone. So, uh, yeah, we're asking, at least I'm asking, shouldn't the city be offering land? And use police Something. and provide them with safety and crisis intervention. I mean, we've seen uh, in the Ottawa region that uh, some people had supplied those ice fishing tents mm -hmm. and room in their parking lot. They did that also in, in uh, Halifax, I believe. Halifax? Yeah. 
I think it was Halifax. Now, so, Halifax never gets as cold as Ottawa or Edmonton or Calgary, but cold, yeah. damp weather in the winter is still enough to kill you. It doesn't matter if it's minus 5 or minus 50. It's still it's enough to kill you. Yeah. Now, with what has been going on in Alberta, it seems that, well, it seems that it is the case, that there was an emergency alert that oh. went out. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. That's yes. Right. Yeah. That uh, asked for people to conserve energy. Yeah. 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 And because in order to avoid some rolling blackouts, intentional rolling blackouts, because the demand on the energy grid was very high. Mm -hmm. Now, why was the demand? on the energy grid very high. Well, all these months while Danielle Smith has been going around saying we can't invest more in solar and in wind and all that kind of stuff because we have to make sure what happens when we need to reclaim the land, even though she doesn't really care about all those orphaned and abandoned mm -hmm. wells. Um, and she keeps on saying, well, we need more base load power and the base load power is the one energy source that the province seems to have is natural gas because there's only one hydroelectric dam in the whole damn province. Right. And there's not much nuclear. No. If any at all. And so basically in the last 50 something years where we've had primarily progressive conservative and conservative governments with only four years of NDP who tried to move Alberta to a capacity based system for a provision of electricity. And the UCB came and said, no, 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 we can't have that. We have to do economic withholding instead. Um, they did not diversify their energy sources at all over 50 years at all. And it yeah. turns out that while Danielle Smith was going all around the province, fear congering about what happens if there's no wind and there's no sun, never factored in the possibility of what if the gas plant shuts down. Yes. And it seems that in Alberta, at certain occasions, there were up to 10 plants that weren't working as they should. And at one point, one that really went down and one that was running way below capacity. And as we got to the prime time, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. time when everybody's cooking and making dinner, it seemed that the people at the, the energy utilities, uh, oh my God, woo we may overload and have to do rolling blackouts. So they put out an alert, an emergency alert, which asked people to conserve energy. And the people did. There was a sharp decrease in demand of about 200 megawatts soon after the alert went out. And according to officials at the utilities, that's what permitted them to get through. It seems also that the premier of Saskatchewan sent some excess energy over the grid towards uh, Alberta. Now you have people going on and saying, hey, it was the coal plants in Saskatchewan that single-handedly saved Alberta. I'm sure the gas plants also from Saskatchewan had a little something to do with that. We also have people going, gee, it's a good thing that Daniel Smith didn't follow Justin Trudeau's recommendations to switch everything. Nobody said switch to solar and wind and shut down everything else immediately. No. Nobody said anything like that. Yes. And nobody said, and then said, well, it's good things, those regulations. Well, the regulations don't come into effect until 2025. So they're not in place. So this has nothing to do with the regulations. Also, the regulations start in 2025 and give up until 2035 for them to happen. So there's a 10 year period. And then the regulations explicitly say that even after 2035, in case of an emergency, like for example, minus 40 degree temperatures over several numbers of days, mm -hmm. that it is quite and perfectly acceptable to use other methods. Of course, because we don't want people to freeze. And for all the people that say, well, you know, like this, gee, if we all had switched to heat pumps, look where we would have been. Well, nobody told you to switch to heat pumps and Absolutely. disconnect from everything else. No. Everybody told you, like this, we have a heat pump here at the Beaver Lodge. We still have our furnace as a backup. We may not we only have to use it one or two or three days a year, 
but we kept it. This is Canada, after all. Nobody ever, it's like one person, two votes. Nobody ever recommended tell you to just like switch off fossil fuels, but don't keep a backup just in case something happens. Did you know? So all these things, all these people are reacting online to things that never happened or never said that haven't started yet. <laughs> so we need to be very clear on this. All of this, 100% of this is Danielle Smith. 100% of it. She created this. Mm -hmm. All of this. She created the situation for this. She created the context for this. All of this is her. And word on the tweet is she wasn't even in the province when it all happened. No, apparently she was in Costa Rica or Jamaica. Or Panama or something. Or yeah, Panama, somewhere south. Yes. Sending messages. Well, gee, thank you so much to the people of Alberta for having done what he needed to do. I yeah. And how about you? Do what needed to be done. And then you had people going, well, if they had switched, well, if they had switched, what would have happened wouldn't have been that you would have been without powers. You, what would have happened is you would have had even more solar and wind to depend on when they were working to feed the grid. In addition to everything you already had because nothing has been shut down yet and no regulations have started because it's not yet 2025. And it's not yet 2035 when the regulations have to be fully implemented. So I'm looking at... All her. All I'm at, her. I'm looking at a uh, uh, thing here called uh, energyrates.ca. Do you know who Canada's largest producer of hydroelectricity is? I would guess Quebec. No. They're number three. Oh. They brag about it so much, I would yeah. thought. Yeah. Their 94% of their grid is hydro. Do you know who number two is? You might be surprised by this. At 96% of their grid... Newfoundland and Labrador. Oh, okay. And number one, this came as a shock to me, and I'm sure it will come as a shock to you and many of the kits and cubs. Take a crazy guess at the number one producer of hydroelectricity in Canada. Like, who, who do you think it could be if it's not Newfoundland, Labrador, Quebec, or Ontario? Ontario is only 24%. Manitoba? Yep. 97% of their grid is hydro. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. wow. That I did not know. Yeah, Manitoba. BC, 67%. Yukon, 80 Northwest Territories, 47 So there's a big drop from Yukon. Ontario, 24 New Brunswick, 22 Saskatchewan, 15 Nova Scotia, 10 And Alberta, 3 And when it comes to Alberta, I'll put this on the screen because it's an interesting... Uh, let me blow it up a bit, actually. So it's a little bit easier to read. There we go. Alberta, electricity sources in Alberta, if the screen works, are unique to the profit because of the problems of abundance of oil, gas, and coal. So natural gas is 60% of the grid, coal and coke 7, wind 20%, solar 6, hydro 5, biomass and geothermal 2, petroleum 0.1, and other 2%. Hmm. Wind is 20%, and what did Danny do? No more clean energy projects. Full moratorium. Killed the sector so that we could have more base load, which have of the same type of heating and electricity that they already have too much of. The one that failed. Yeah. The one that sent them freezing in the dark. And I remember that big advertising campaign on all those TT buses. No one wants to freeze in the dark. Mm -hmm. Telling Justin Trudeau to not do all this stuff. And ironically, I, I, like, I'm feeling like Alanis Morissette should you just be like floating down from heaven onto the screen going, isn't it ironic? Don't you <laughs> Don't think? You think? <laughs> I should not be laughing, but I... <laughs> I'm laughing at Danny. Well, not the plate of Albertans. No, I'm you guys, I, you guys have elected yourself a dud and it's and never been more evident warn than you. now. We tried to warn you and we the worst did. is, and we've seen this before. We've seen this in Texas with Greg Abbott. Yeah. And they're about to go through it again. Stupid policies by stupid people who are shilling for an industry rather than doing the bare minimum they need to do to take care of their people. Like keep the heat on. Mm-hmm. 
Now, if you happen to be living in a place where you're having trouble with your heat, one of the things that's recommended to do is find the smallest room that you have in your house, have a table, bring one in, put blankets all around, build yourself a big blanket for it, and go under there. It's easier to keep a small room warm mm-hmm. than a big house. Create the blanket fort, put blankets all around, create a smaller space within that where you can be under to keep warm, have some candles, be very careful with them. Do not run your generators or your gas barbecues inside your house. No, that that will kill you. Your gas stove. That will kill you. Do not do that. No, it's very bad news. Uh, You will die of carbon monoxide poisoning. And it happens every winter. Somebody gets desperate enough and they're cold enough, and I understand because desperate people do desperate things. It's simple human behavior. But if you run a barbecue of any type inside your home, well, let, 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 hang on a sec. Let me back that up. If you run a barbecue, gas, propane, or charcoal, it will kill you. If you have an electric barbecue, they do exist. Uh, I have a friend who, because her condo board would not allow for gas barbecues on, on their balconies, she put an electric one in, which I didn't know existed at the time. And it ran just like a regular barbecue. So if you have an electric one, okay, probably not going to put out as much heat as a gas one would, but I'm telling you right now, if you put a gas barbecue in your home, you're going to die. It's as simple as that. It just creates too much CO2 and you you can only handle so much before you suffocate. So please, I beg of you, if you can avoid it at all costs, please do so. I understand, again, desperate people do desperate things in desperate times. And extreme cold will make you do desperate things. Mm -hmm. As someone who worked outside in extreme cold, I get it. Yeah. Um, There was an interview that Post Media did on Sunday morning with Alberta Electric System Operator Spokesperson Leif Solid. And uh, he has stated as, uh, quoted as saying, With the extreme cold, we are seeing very, very high demand. We set an all-time record Thursday night, 12,384 megawatts. The key difference, and there's never one single factor that puts us into a grid alert, it's the extreme cold. We've had to reduce imports and very little wind. And of course... When we get into the peak period from 4 to 7 p.m. at this time of the year, we don't have any solar power. So on Thursday, we were in a bit better situation because we had strong wind. We had 1,200 megawatts approximately throughout the peak period from 4 to 7. So that really made a difference. Over the last couple of days, the wind has dropped off dramatically. We've also had a couple of natural gas plants. One is offline and one is operating at reduced capacity. Um, And then he was asked, how are you coping to to cover the drop in wind with imports from other states and provinces. We're hoping to cover it with every single source we can access. We did put out a call for emergency imports, and we did get some additional supply last night across the Saskatchewan tie line and the BC tie line. So that did help us. And then we worked with the Alberta government to put out the emergency alert, asking Albertans to conserve electricity, and that made a huge difference. We saw within a matter of minutes 200 megawatts of demand fall off the system, and that got us through that peak without having to resort to rotating outages. That was huge. We were at fairly significant risk of having to go to rotating outages, but that did not happen. And that was really a result of Albertans conserving energy when we asked them to. And we've seen pictures all over online that while individual Albertans did, big corporations like, for example, the Rexall Center in Calgary did not. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. No, the the Rexall Center is in Edmonton. Uh, Uh, Sorry, not in Edmonton. Scotiabank is the Saddle Dome. The Saddle, yeah. Oh, 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 but all the casinos were open and running at full capacity in Calgary. Uh, Saw that post from a colleague about that. Yeah. And, and now I would with, say Rexall Place was fully operational. Yeah. yeah. Now, with regard to that, uh, Leaf Solid said, we operate the grid at transmission level. You'd have to talk to NMAX and EPCOR and others to see what they do at the local level. At the transmission level, the high voltage lines that we dispatch electricity across throughout the province, we have agreements with large industrial customers like pulp and paper plants very large demand customers where we can ask them to curtail load to reduce their power demand or even go offline. And we would certainly have done that yesterday. Now they were asked, asked when the alert went out last night, we were a couple of hours into the peak 4 PM to 7 PM demand period. Why was there not an indication earlier in the day to, to say, Hey, take a little strain off the system. If you can, the response was we did put out a social media request. So 
We did put out on social media requesting Albertans to conserve electricity. I think we had a tweet that went out at about 12 noon or so. We were in a position over the supper hour like 6 p.m. where we were not certain whether we could get through the absolute peak without having to go to rotating outages. So we worked with the provincial government to put out that emergency alert. That's the first time we've done that. We were in a potential supply deficit of 100 to 200 megawatts, and that's after using all of our backup reserves. The grid changes second to second. We do look ahead, and of course we have contingencies in place. But it's a very, very, very diamond. But it's very, very, very dynamic. And so that emergency alert, we had a phenomenal result. We saw the power drop by approximately 200 megawatts within minutes, and it made the difference. Um, here's the thing. Alberta's gotten down to that weather before. Many times. And this has this never happened. New. Yeah, this is not new. This has never happened before. So what is the difference between now and then justin trudeau you know you know somebody's gonna say that except truth be told and some people might not like hearing this justin trudeau has done more for alberta than any premier ever you don't you don't like what i'm saying the receipts are all there for your viewing he has given more money to that province than any prime minister in history period and he's building a pipeline Yes. At great political capital cost to himself, losing yes. a lot of the NDP liberal swing vote. They, they, they're not happy with him for that. He's like, Alberta wants this. Alberta needs it. We got to get, you know, and, and, and then they, so he's going to do this at great, like you said, at great political capital. And then you will have people in Alberta going, why isn't he doing anything for us? He's going to make us drive electric cars and he's forcing us and mandate. He was the first person to say, we have to phase it out, but we need to do it strategically over a long time period because we're not going to be without oil tomorrow. So we're going to phase it out over time. Oil will still be used even when it's not powering our vehicles or, or our homes. You go to a hospital, damn near everything in it is petroleum-based, like IV lines, bags, uh, all of the equipment. It's all petroleum-based. It's a simple matter of fact. So we're not phasing oil. It's until we find a way to create a bio mass product, we won't be phased. In my lifetime, oil will not be gone. From vehicles, yes. From power grids, yes. Gone altogether? Nope. No, it simply can't. We don't have any replacements for those things yet. And until we can come up with something. Yep. And then we got Saskatchewan Premier Scott Slomo tweeting, Sask Power is providing 153 megawatts of electricity to Alberta this evening to assess them through this shortage. That power will be coming from natural gas and coal-fired plants, the ones the Trudeau government is telling us to shut down, which we won't. Yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. Yeah. Yeah, you will. Because at some point, what's going to happen is that the products you make with that, you will not be able to sell on international markets. So yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. And I think it's the uh, International Energy Agency has uh, stated that 2024 is expected to be the year uh, where uh, uh, global demand for coal is going to start going down. Yes. Uh, and yes. and the, the country that probably burns the most amount of coal is, is China. Yes. And they have been actively looking to reduce that over the last number of years and it has gotten to the point where the government is like okay we have to make the change we have to but we won't have a planet and i'm i'm not cheering on the communist chinese party okay please understand that they're also going to have revolts and they know that and it's, it's already like starting to happen right? yeah the political system that you have is not going to stop people from protesting or revolting when they can't breathe that's right it's as simple as that. So they, they are actively changing their ways. They're moving to, to, I don't think they're moving to nukes because I don't, I don't know actually enough of what their power grid is. Hmm. But coal is, is largely used to, to, for cooking and heating homes throughout China and in rural areas and cities. It's different altogether. But they're, they're phasing out coal altogether in China. And they're, they'll do it quicker than anybody because they're just going to say, this is what we're doing. And everybody will go, okay. <laughs> Because what else are they going to do, number one? But number two, 
people know, the vast majority of the population know we can't continue to do this. We're going to die if we do it. And you remember when they Beijing held the Olympics in 2008? Mm -hmm. They restricted the use of coal-fired power plants and this and that and the other thing so that the skies would be clear and the air would be clear for the Olympics. Yep. And, and all the people that went, hey, we should do this all the time. That was the big push. It really was. Yep. So the largest coal uh, burning country on earth is changing their ways because they realize they have to. But you got old Danny in Alberta just doesn't want to accept that there are other alternative energy sources. And it's not so much that she doesn't want to accept it. It's that her puppet master oligarchy that controls her, the oil barons, if you will, the party donors are telling her, no, this is what we're doing. And she's, okay, I'll do it. And this is why you're going to privatize healthcare because we don't want to pay for it anymore. Okay, I'll do it. We're living in a terrible time right now, but it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't. Collectively, and let me borrow a, a line from the United States of America, we the people can get together and push back. And we're doing it because we're tired of the lies. We're tired of the myths and disinformation. We're tired of the gaslighting. And oh boy, are we tired of politicians lying on a daily basis and getting away with it. Mm -hmm. 2024 she, is the year of the pushback. She needs to wear this. Oh, yes. She needs to be made to wear this. This She is cannot be a Teflon her. Don. Yeah. Teflon Dan, I guess, in this case. She cannot be. Nope. She's got to own this, wear it, accept it. It's her responsibility. And remember, you heard the ads on the radio here in Ontario? Yeah. Oh, we can't let Justin Trudeau. It has nothing to do with the Prime Minister of Canada. Yep. She can blame Stephen Gilbo all she wants on this one. This one is all, all her. 100% her fault. 100%. So, Danny. Oh, Danielle. Come home. Come home and do your damn job. And speaking about come home and do your damn job, Doug Ford and Sylvia Jones, where the fuck are you? Yeah. Okay. Have you seen the latest COVID numbers and wastewater numbers for Ontario? Where are you? You guys need to get back home too. Oh boy, do I got to show you something. Just saying. Oh, I got to show you this. This just came across my feed. You're going to, oh my goodness. <laughs> You're going to love this. All right. From, from our favorite uh, idiot politician in this country former political, a uh, former party leader, Andrew Scheer, mm. tweeted this. Well, the Alberta government asked people not to charge their electric cars due to the extreme cold straining the grid. CBC publishes this article. Brilliant. $1.3 billion billion of your tax dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Saskatoon, electric cars are the best vehicle in frigid temperatures, Saskatchewan advocates say. Saskatchewan may be in a deep freeze, but EV drivers say they are toasty warm. Published January 13th, 2024. So this is interesting. Um, he's trying to make the case that everybody has an electric car and they're demanding so much from the grid. They don't. It's already been proven the demand from electric car charging is not nearly as much as a casino. <laughs> <laughs> or I don't know, an NHL hockey arena or an yep. office building with every light on every floor. Yep. <sighs> Reading from the article with the federal government planning to phase out sales of new gas powered vehicles during the next decade, many drivers question how they will fare on cold prairie days like this week's, but two electric car enthusiasts who chatted with host Leisha Grabinski on CBC's blue sky this week say they love driving their vehicles in the winter. Quote, it heats up faster than any gas car I've ever had. It's more reliable, said Tyler Krauss, who sits on the board of the Saskatchewan Electrical Vehicle Association and founded the Tesla Owners Club of Saskatchewan. Quote, you know there's no starting of the car. It's always just kind of on, right? It's like a phone, basically on a, basically or a computer on wheels. The major downside is winter. In winter is the loss of driving range and really frigid temperatures, Krauss said. 
is Tesla Model 3 can generally travel 500 kilometers on a single charge in the summer, but on cold winter days, that decreases to around 300 kilometers, which is not going to stop you from driving in city living. If you're out in rural areas, okay. I can see how that could be, you know, an issue, mm -hmm. which is why you probably, if you're out in a rural area, you, you're not driving a, a small little Honda Civic or a Toyota Tercel. You're probably driving an F-150. So you can look at, alternatively, a Rivian, an F-150 Lightning, or even a Cybertruck. Because those, which are electrical, have incredible range and massive battery packs. Mm -hmm. The F-150 Lightning actually has a port that will let you run your house in the event of a blackout. Yep. For up to three days. Yep. Yep. With the charging infrastructure that has come online in the last few years in the province, that's still enough to feel confident leaving town, he said. Matthew Pointer, who also drives a Tesla Model 3, said he finds his electric vehicle to be a much better driving experience in the winter than a gas car. Quote, I believe that an electric is the best vehicle in these temperatures just because it's a simpler car. It's taking care of itself, even if I'm not thinking about it. I can leave my vehicle unplugged overnight to minus 40, fire up the app on my phone, preheat the car, heated steering wheel, heated seats. Basically, I hop in the car, everything is defrosted, toasty warm, and away I go. Yeah. Yep. Fuel savings vary from car to car, but Krauss said that for a car with an average size battery, about 70 kilowatts hour, charging from 0 to 100% will cost about $10 when charged at home at an electricity rate of about 14 cents per kilowatt hour. Pointer says the cost savings of driving an electric vehicle for five years are insane. He and Krauss have both calculated they have saved between $25,000 and $30,000 over five years in fuel wow. maintenance. The upfront cost of longer range electric vehicles can still be a barrier, they acknowledged. This is from Jillian. My car was 100% charged yesterday morning. Range was 250 kilometer, kilometers instead of 320. But the range came back up to 284 as the batteries warmed. This is true. You will notice once the batteries get warm, and the batteries do warm up because you know, they generate their own heat source, uh, you will notice that in your phone. If you go outside in the extreme cold, you'll watch the charge drop to 50%. You go back inside. Once it warms up, the charge comes right back up again. Right. Right. Now, and, and Cassie had pointed out here that uh, the F-250 or the 350 are not there yet. And, and that is correct, yes. The, the bigger, the bigger long-haul tr trucks, they're not there yet electrically. They aren't. And we get that. And we're not saying if you're out in a rural area or if you're on a farm to just go 100% electric right now. We're not saying that. No, nobody's saying that. Nobody is. The only people are saying that are the people that are anti-moving the electric. Well, if we do that, we'll... No, but nobody's saying that. But what if that happened? But nobody's saying that. Well, under these policies, that would have happened. No, the policy doesn't no. say that. Well, Trudeau's tell you to do that. No, no. Trudeau. It's actually explicitly written in the policy. Yes. So that, yes, you can, if there's an emergency, please do use other sources. They do not freeze to death. Nobody's recommending this. It's like you're responding to stuff that needs to exist in your fantasy world in order to give you something to react to. To bias make your narrative stick. Yeah, they bias confirmation echo chamber to keep your narrative up and alive and running and make you feel better about yourself to know that you're right. But here's the thing, you're not. <laughs> and facts don't care about your feelings and neither does Mother Nature. They built out, and I'll, I'll, I'll say Tesla specifically, Tesla specifically built out their EV charging network much faster than I ever thought it could have happened like much fat it's deployed look a colleague of mine in toronto has a tesla model s it's about seven years old now and he you know he's part of a tesla club and he, he was out one day and in, in, in uh, up by barry uh, no not barry um wasaga wasaga beach and he, he met a fellow at a charging station along the way and they were having a nice chat and the guy says yeah no i live out in uh I live in Newfoundland. He goes, really? He goes, uh, yeah, I'm just on my way back. He goes, back? From where? Oh, Vancouver. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, you can drive all the way across country in a Tesla now. That was in 2017. That conversation took place. You can drive coast to coast in an electric vehicle in this country. You get to a supercharging station and you can have your battery up full 100% in 20 minutes. Now, I understand Sometimes you don't want to do this. Sometimes you don't want to do that. But change is good. Change is necessary. And we don't have a planet B. 
and you've all seen the price of um, automotive petroleum, petrol, gasoline, it ain't cheap. Mm -hmm. And as Cassie can attest, driving a big truck, filling that tank up is expensive. We're not there yet with electric vehicles, but it is being adopted much quicker. And, and the adoption, I'm not talking about the consumer, the adoption by the big car companies has come much faster than I ever thought it would have. I thought it would have been like trying to move a mountain, but they're all in. All of them are all in on electric because they realize they don't have a choice anymore. Yep. And um, there's one particular tweet that did not age well at all that is being recorded because, of course, the internet is forever. And it's from Rob Anderson, oh, you know, yeah. the guy that old Daniela brought in to essentially run stuff for her. Mm -hmm. On May 4th, 2023, Responding to a tweet that says NDP lie detector from NDP at NDP lie detector. It says Rachel Nachi thinks industry supports her net zero by 2035 plan. But let's listen to what a major utility CEO thinks about what this notly Trudeau plan would do to the economy. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. To which Rod Anderson says. Oh, sorry. Let me just go back there. Be warned, Alberta. This is what will be coming under the notly NDP. Your power bills will skyrocket. And then there are the brownouts in January. What month is it? It's January. And what did they just try to avoid having Brownouts. happen? Uh huh. And who's and, the government? And who's the government? <laughs> oh, the UCP. And by how much have electricity bills skyrocketed year over year now? Oh, one hundred and forty percent. Oopsie. <laughs> I'm 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 laughing at the situation, not people in Alberta freezing. Okay, I don't want anybody to suffer. Even right. people I don't like, I don't want to suffer. I'm still when you human. When you see me double blink like this, you have to imagine the sound of a dull cowbell going clunk clunk. Yes, I just <laughs> it's, uh, they tell you what their own policies are going to do, but blame it on the other guy. <sighs> to get you to give them permission to do the thing that will cause the thing that they say that the other guy will cause. <laughs> we tried write to tell you, Alberta. We can't write this. <laughs> Comedy writers would be like, well, this is just completely absurd. There's no one would believe this. And how many times have I said that in the last three years of doing this show? Honest yep. to goodness. It's yep. a life uh, art imitating life, imitating art and, and truth is stranger than fiction. Yep. And, and Kit Leanne has it here. Honestly, when has any other province browned out during the winter? Alberta, the big energy mecca that keeps on reminding us that if it weren't for them, all of us would be freezing in the dark and we'd all be poor because they bring so much to the economy. They couldn't run a deficit. They couldn't run a surplus when oil was going for $140 a barrel. And they can't keep the lights on in minus 40. And now, now every other province can. Th this, this, uh, this statement. But they're from... supposed to be the masters of energy and they can't. The statement from Leanne here is it actually, so I'm going to, there's a caveat to that, if you will. Yes. Very true statement, but the caveat is this. Back in the winter of 88, I believe That's it was. The ice storm. No, no, no. 88, not oh, 98. 88. Okay. 88. 98 was different. The grid was physically collapsing. Uh, yes. Winter of 88, uh, early November, it snowed and got cold here in Ottawa. And it never got above minus 18 until... Um, I think February, it, it, it hovered around minus 25 the entire month of December. Mm -hmm. I remember that winter well. And now we never had a brownout. We never had a power failure. But they, uh, I remember the province was asking people to not run things that were not necessary. 
because the grid uh, was in extremely high demand for everything just, just to keep the country operational. And like it or not, the economic engine of this country is the province of Ontario. It's by sheer numbers. There's almost 16 million of us. I'm not taken away from any other province because everybody does contribute and do, do, does their own thing and every province contributes to the fabric Absolutely. that is this nation. But the economic engine of Canada is Ontario. It's as simple as that. PSC, uh, all the big corporations are here. There's 16 million people. It's sheer numbers. But at the time in 88, when there was considerably less people, I don't even know what the population might have been 12 million at the time, or maybe 10 million. I'd have to look it up. But the grid was under extreme stress because when, when you have temperatures that hover no, never above minus 18 for three months, three months and i remember the snow didn't start we in the end of march we still had a meter of snow on the ground oh wow thank you sean thank you wow. sean thank you um you we just uh donated a super chat amount for the mac mini fund and this is what we're operating on today folks is the new mac mini which i'm still getting used to because apple does everything different so. <laughs> Yep. It's a little complicated, but I will say this, uh, my hat is off to them. Mind you, my old rig is a gaming rig from 12 years ago. So, you know, long in the tooth, but yeah. But yeah, uh, we didn't have a brownout. So Leanne, you, you are correct. No province has ever had a brownout, but they did ask us to, you know, reduce our consumption in 88 only because the demand was so high at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Never did have a brownout. But they did ask us, if you if you don't need to use something, please, could we ask you to back it off a bit? Now, we hear that in the summer frequently. Yes. Frequently in the summer, which is like, okay, yeah, you're right. I can just, I don't need the room. My, my bedroom doesn't need to be 18 degrees. I can put it up to 24 and still be comfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, indeed, indeed. So, yeah, you know, just... And then 1998, if people look at that, of course, that was the ice storm ice where, where it was the electrical pylons that were tipping over because they Completely had so much collapsed. ice on them. Yes. It had nothing to do with the actual able to generate electricity or get electricity from point A to point B. Um, thank you, Kit Donna, Mr. Beaver, Luke, and Spiffy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we have to go soon, Kits and Cubs, but there's a couple of things I just wanted to mention here. Um, you know how we mention about the NDP and how they need to make a decision to finally stop trying to replace the liberals as the natural governing party mm -hmm. and make the case that the conservatives don't deserve to be the government and not even the opposition. Seems that they're not taking that advice. Um, what have they done? I uh, just sent you a little tweet there oh, okay. talking yeah. about uh, the dental care program. Yes. And this one chapped my ass. Yeah, Pardon my language. Put this, put this on the screen here for you. It's a photo of a kid brushing his teeth. And I'm bringing it up. Looking it up in the mirror. And the NDP writes, with the NDP dental care plan, families across the country will save money. The NDP dental plan will help families save at least $1,300 a year, the Bibbage says. We did that. Not the liberals and certainly not the conservatives. Well, that's 50% accurate. 50% oh. accurate. You did not do that alone. Certainly without the conservatives, but you didn't do it on your own. And it's this type of petty childishness yes. that is the reason, the exact reason for which the NDP does not get the liberal swing vote. A Doing lot of the liberal like swing vote goes conservative instead of the NDP. You never learn, do you? Liberals will work with you. They're not your enemy. They maybe don't want to go as far and as fast as you do but they do want to go in the same general direction. But you can't quit bashing them, can you? You can't quit it. You just love it so much. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. That is not how you win over hearts and minds. You send the signal to everyone that you're untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. 
You made an agreement. They upheld their end of the bargain. We did this. It was our idea. But together we got it done. The conservatives didn't help you. The bloc didn't help you either. They voted against it, but you didn't mention that in your tweet. The, the two Green members voted with it. You didn't mention them. The one independent MP didn't vote with you. You didn't do it alone. No. Three parties. Three parties did it. And without the governing party, it would have just been another idea. They really need to stop doing this. Smarten up. We have a situation in which one of the federal parties has dispensed with truth, logic, and reason. And in some cases, a will to adhere to basic principles of democracy. Stop making the case that the other guys are the bad guys. Please. Please. But the guys that actually help you get a policy that you held dear for many years implemented are the bad guys. Stop it. Just this is not this is not how you win over people by pointing out somebody else's. Well, first off, lying. You're lying. The liberals didn't do this. Actually, without the liberals, it wouldn't have happened. So come on, stop that. Like stop it. I understand that you need to do what you need to do to, you know, keep tied to your base. But lying about the people with whom you partner to get stuff done is not how you do it. We, we should get Jugmeat on the show if we can and ask him if he's in control of this or if it's his comms people. And we're going to tell him point blank, you need, to, you need to sweep house on your comms people because this is, this is terrible. This is a terrible thing that's been done. It's terrible it's, because it's, it's, it's a lie. It's a half-truth, if anything. You couldn't have done it on your own. You know that. You know that. You could not have done this on your own. You don't have the seats or the power to do it. You did it with the liberals and the bloc. So stop this. So Jagmeet, if you're listening, if this gets to you, we'd love to have you on the show. Uh, we won't do gotcha questions, but we are asking you in advance. Who in your comms people is doing this? Because it needs to stop. Because you're pissing off your base and anybody who was on the fence is like, I don't want this kind of politics. And they'll vote liberal because they're sick of, people are so sick of the mud raking, the muck, mud slinging, the finger pointing, that, like, just no, stop it. Stop it. Why you're better lie? than this. Why lie when the truth will do? The truth will do. It was our idea. It was a great idea. We brought it to the table. We got them to agree. And then we did it together. Oh my not, God. Politicians we working together as, as working together to improve the lives of Canadians. Which was what people wanted by voting in a minority government. Yes. By saying we did this, you would be given the people what they asked for. Just give the people what they asked for. Stop trying to take full credit, dude. What's wrong with you guys? It's like the party, ha party has ideas that are good and absolutely no strategy. None. Just none. Position yourselves. Yeah. Ugh. Well, this is it. My dogs are goth has nailed it. The ego is more important. God. That's the message you're sending to us. Reined it in. Like you're... Jug me, you got to get your comms people under control because this is terrible. This is terrible messaging. We've said this on this program before. You are losing members of your base because they don't like this. Traditional dippers want no part of that type of politics. I know. If you learned anything from Ed Broadbent. If you learned a damn thing from Ed Broadbent. Who you claim is a mentor. Yeah. You would not be doing this. So, bro. Brah. Come on, man. Come on the show. Let's have a conversation. 
we don't do gotcha. If you've watched any of our interviews with other political people, and we've had a couple of politicians on, a member of parliament federally, a liberal member of parliament, and the liberal leader and the official opposition in the province of New Brunswick. And no candidates. Gotcha. And candidates as well. No gotcha questions. Okay? But I'm asking you up front, who's your comms people, and why are they still employed? If you run the next federal election like you did the last one, going around TV like you were a jolted ex, Justin Trudeau keeps on saying he will do this, but he never writes, he never calls. I was waiting for him by the phone for prom, and he didn't go. He went with Becky instead. Mm -hmm. You're not winning over people. <sighs> you did it with help. You did it with help. You networked. You convinced, you persuaded, you did all that stuff. Yes, you can take credit for all of that, but you did it with help. Nothing is done in a vacuum. My word. Mm -hmm. Jeez. All right, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All right, kids and cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And kids... You have, you have indeed been telling people all about us because um, we got some good news over the course of the weekend, didn't we, Mr. Grizzly? Mm -hmm. From our, uh, I can't say our friends from feedspot.com because we don't, we, don't, we don't know them <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, but for some reason, their latest evaluation of the top poly Canadian political podcasts came out and... Um, this one came out a little faster than the one, bef the, the, the one before, but um, the last time we were part of the top five Canadian political podcasts because we came in at number four. Well, according to this one, we are now top three kids and cubs right behind Power and Politics and The Bridge by Peter Bansbridge. We actually switched places with CBC's at issue. I'm now, that issue is the things. most watched political show or political segment in Canada, at least on TV. Mm -hmm. And um, we're ahead of that. Now. Yeah, I'm still kind of, what? What? How, how did that yeah. happen? <laughs> yeah. So, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. i am i am i am uh, not equipped and very stunned um but hey since we're doing it let's not stop till we get to the top although i do not know how it is we're going to manage to get ahead of peter mansbridge though no, i don't think that'll ever happen yeah that might not happen but you know what we're gonna do our darndest to try Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in the battle for hearts and minds, the thing that we have to remember is is to be kind when we're explaining to somebody how wrong they are about something that you're doing. And that is something that I'm still working on. I have to treat it, and this is something that I'm very good at, actually. I have to treat it like a customer service representative would when you encounter a an angry, upset client. Yep. I was... I was very good at that uh, back in my sales days of, of being able to just calm people down and let's get to the heart of the matter. And I need to remember how to do that when, when confronting somebody who is screaming things that we are, know are patently false Indeed. and untrue. Indeed. So tell your peeps and poops all about us. Keep doing that. We really appreciate that. If you would like to make sure you don't miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. You go to our pod page, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And that way, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly into your inbox. We don't have all the squigglies there on the screen, Mr. Grizzly. And I'm if you would like to make sure that you uh, don't miss an episode when it comes to our YouTube feed, then you go to our True North Eager Beaver, ah, there it is, True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube site and make like hit Elaine and smash with the like, share, and subscribe buttons. We're getting so close to 600 subscribers, so thank you so very much. We really appreciate that. And if you would like to contribute to the emergency hydration fund here at the Beaver Lodge, 
then that squiggly by Mr. Grizzly's head is the QR code to our coffee page and where you will find our tip jar at coffee. That's ko ficom slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. We really appreciate what you uh, donate there. Do remember, kids, that uh, we appreciate the donations through Super Chat, but if you want to make sure that more of your donation gets to us, like 95% of it rather than 70, coffee is the place to go. It's a couple of extra steps. It requires a little extra work, but we appreciate it very much. Oh, someone just scanned a QR code. Thank you. Thank you so very much. <laughs> we really appreciate that because democracy is something that you do. Go get your shots. If you are out west, do make sure to look at your consumption particularly between four to seven, we are told that uh, according to the weather, things will start to get better on a Tuesday out in Alberta and things are starting to get to better in BC today. Mm. So just hang on for a little bit more and uh, hopefully things will be all right soon enough. What else do we have? Oh yes. And uh, if, you, if you can donate to the Red Cross and write those letters, Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. You know, uh, I, I find myself thinking more and more about how I need to approach those on the other side of the fence who are have been misled and misinformed and are so entrenched in their ideas that maybe if I can have a conversation with them instead of turning into full blue jacket guy and yelling at them about how wrong they are when they are wrong, if I can have a conversation. Now, of course, there are exclusions. If you're a Nazi spewing Nazi vile racist hatred, you're dead to me. I'm not talking with you. I'm not talking with you. I might yell at you, but I'm not talking with you. But if your political ideology is uh, been misconstrued or warped or, or taken off track by somebody, especially a politician who has lied to you, I will point out to you with receipts how you were wrong how that politician has lied to you, how, have they, how they have led you astray. And I need to remember to do it with uh, love in my heart. Sometimes that is difficult. And when somebody is in your face screaming that, oh, it's everything in my, what's wrong with my life is because of Justin Trudeau. It's like, no, no, it's because you're dumb and make bad choices. Except I shouldn't say that either. <laughs> so try and dial up and ratchet up the kindness as we win over hearts and minds. And get the truth to people because oftentimes people are upset because they've been lied to and they've believed the lies. And that is something that I need to remember so that we can make this world a better place for all of us. That's some very good words of wisdom, Mr. Grizzly. Thank you. Kits and cups until next time, please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, please roll those credits. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, kids and cubs, and just a very little quick Easter egg. The Australian Open has started. Oh, yeah. Leila, Leilani Fernandes won her first round match. Janice Shapovalov, who's trying to come back from injury, has lost his uh, first. Um, Rebecca Marino has qualified into the main draw. And uh, Felix Ogialiasim is currently on courts against uh, Dominic Team. He's up two sets to one and uh, best of five. So hopefully we'll have more things to report. Oh, and also fanboying because Gabriela Dabrowski, our doubles player who won the U.S. Open last year in doubles, followed my personal account. <laughs> so maybe we are one step closer to actually getting her as an interview. Well, you never someday. know. Someday. Yeah. But not while yeah. she's at the Australian Open competing. Of we course. We want her to focus on that. 
I just want to give a shout out to the Green Bay Packers who were expected to get wiped off the map and they actually destroyed Dallas and along with Detroit for actually winning a game. Way to go, Detroit Lions. I'm, I'm a CFL guy, but I'll watch the playoffs in the NFL. Once this once once the Great Cup is played, I pay attention to the NFL. Yep. All right, Kiss and Cubs, I got to go because I got four minutes to leave so I can catch my bus.